Do you have good afternoon. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. All right. These are strange times, as you probably are all well aware. If you watch CNN or Fox News, the news is loaded, and every news story revolves around the present danger. Uh, it changes daily. Uh, we have no scientific or medical background that we, in which we could advise you, but we're turning to the Board of Health in the town. Uh, these people are constantly in, uh, in uh, coordination with the state and federal officials, uh, but in, in their defense, it changes momentarily. So we thought in, in the eyes of trying to get out as much information as quickly as possible uh, that we'd call this meeting. Uh, and we're very thankful that the town officials have agreed to do this. Um, uh, ironically, I was going to call a meeting within the next two weeks of everybody in Brownstone 1 and Brownstone 2 uh, to talk about the pending construction. Uh, in view of what happens with meetings nowadays, I'm not sure that meeting is going to um, uh, happen, so I'm going to stay today after uh, Amy is through and the fire chief are through talking to you. I'm going to stay and talk about the future construction because I know that's Excellent. on everyone's mind. The important thing is not the construction. That's coming. It's going to happen. It's going to affect everybody's life, but it's not. What she has is the important stuff, and that's what we're here today for. So uh, with that said, just so you know, we have brought in some of our staff here uh, so that we can be in, in informed as, as you are, and we're going to try to stay ahead of this, although this moves very, very quickly. Uh, Amy, would you take sure. that up? So my name is Amy Petrosky. Like they said, I'm the director of the health department, and Paul is the fire chief, but he's also our emergency management director, and that's the hat that he's wearing today. Yes. Oh, okay. yeah. So um, again, uh, we are not medical professionals. I'm here to give you some information uh, as a public health professional. Um, I thought that the format for today's meeting is we're going to give you some general information and then I think really what's best is for to use this session as a Q&A for you guys to get your questions answered because um, if you have the question probably the person sitting to your right or left might also have the same question. So COVID-19 also known as coronavirus. Coronavirus is a family of viruses and COVID-19 is a little piece of that family. So that's why you'll hear it referred to as either COVID-19 or coronavirus. It often presents with a fever, a sore throat, a cough, or shortness of breath as the stages evolve. <clears throat> Some of the things that you can do to protect yourselves as well as the people in your, com your small community of Brownstone and then the larger communities of East Longmeadow and Massachusetts is that if you're sick, stay home. If you think you're not feeling well, but you think it might just be a cold, play it safe. Stay home anyways. Um, if you're home and you're having trouble and you need some assistance and you're calling 911, when you call them, let them know you're calling them because you're experiencing shortness of breath, you have a fever, and you're concerned. That way they know how to protect themselves when they come in to help you. Um, if you need to cough or sneeze, you know, this is the proper way to do that. You're, you're, taking all of the, the moisture and virus that you might be spreading around and putting it right into, I've heard this uh, referred to as your cough pocket. That's how they, they teach the kids in school now. Um, and practice good social distancing techniques. Right now we're all really close, but as um, if the virus were to come to East Longmeadow, we would want to make sure we're keeping that spacing and that distances between us. Yesterday the, the governor declared a state of emergency. So he, he'd like all municipalities to look at events that they're hosting of 50 or more town-wide functions. And that's one of the things that the town is currently doing. So it's the town, it, the situation is, is, when I tell you it's changing by the hour, I cannot be more serious. We are getting updates from public health nurses, DPH, emer the state emergency management system, the governor's office, the school department. I mean, it is coming in, it is a well-oiled machine, and we're all working together. So, but information that you're getting today may change when I leave here. So I would highly recommend, if you are not signed up on the town-wide notification system, to get signed up. If you need help with that, I'm, can contact, I can let you know and then you can help them. Um, if you use so social media, we put out, um, updates on our Facebook page um, almost daily. Uh, and if, it, if it's not relative to COVID-19, it's hand washing techniques. Yesterday I put up a great video using black light about the way, how it looks when you wash your hands, um, how most of us wash our hands, and then the difference of the amount of germs that are killed when we wash our hands for 20 seconds. So if you're on um, social media, I would highly recommend following 
um, the health department's page. We don't spam you. We don't reach out to you directly. You'll just see um, the information that we're putting out. The town departments who are usually involved in uh, emergency planning have been meeting uh, for weeks now, talking about ways that we can help the town um, municipal government as well as our town residents be prepared for this should it start to come to our area. One of the things that we're doing is increasing the sanitizing that's done at town hall, at schools, at council on aging, and other municipal buildings. That way we know that the sanitation practices that are occurring are sufficient enough to kill COVID-19 because a lot of the practices that were that could be occurring haven't been. So one of the things I want to state on that is uh, you see the CDC or the news put out Lysol wipes kill co coronavirus, right? If you read the fine print of those, you have to let it stay wet for five to 10 minutes. And if you've ever used a bleach wipe and you wipe a surface, that surface is not wet for five to 10 minutes. So essentially, you're not killing the virus on the surface. So you have to really read the back of the label of the chemical you're using. It should say human coronavirus, and then you should read the instructions for how to kill viruses. And if you need help with that, my department can help walk you through it. If you call us with the chemical, we can pull it up online and tell you the proper sanitation techniques. Okay? So that's one important point that will help you guys really protect yourselves. The other thing that we're doing in town hall is uh, where all departments across the town are working on a continuity of operations plan. So this is a plan that each town department head is working on that will help the entire town function should coronavirus come to our area and start to affect municipal services. That way your services that are provided to you shouldn't be interrupted. We should have the ability to meet all the essential services and needs of the town regardless of what happens in East Long Meadow with the coronavirus or a fire or a flood or a tornado. These continuity of operation plans are valid across all emergencies. Is there anything that I've missed of the, the general? I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, it kind of in lines with what Chris had mentioned. Um, the meeting was called for the coronavirus, but I, I got to say, I've been here before for fire prevention meetings and classes and trainings, and there hasn't been this many people in the room. It's unfortunate that it's come to this, but, and like Amy said, our positions are ever changing. It's an evolution. It's an unknown evolution to all of us. Um, when H1N1 was out there, it wasn't as feared as this is right now. Um, so we are, we're, we're, we're taking all the precautions um, that are recommended by uh, the CDC, Department of Public Health, the Governor's Office, and MEMA. Um, we're, we're, we, we got a phone conference this afternoon um, we have to listen in and see if there's anything new that we need to know about. So um, stay tuned. Keep, keep your eyes on the news. Um, hopefully it's a reputable news source. Most of the stuff out there, it's been pretty accurate. Um, some of the numbers might be a little off, but the information they're giving you seems to be pretty accurate. And uh, again, any, um, any health issues, you guys know the number, 911. We're always here to help. Um, we know the address. We, we know how to get in and out of the facility. And... And they're going to ask you when you call, um, have you had any, you know, what, what's, what's, what's your um, issue, what's your symptoms, what's your, what, what are you presenting with? And they may ask you if you've traveled, because that was one of the initial triggers before. Unfortunately, that's not just the only trigger anymore. It's, um, it's here. Uh, you don't have to travel to any of those other countries anymore. You could have just went grocery shopping at the big Y. Fortunately and enough, what, what Paul means by it's here is that he means yeah. it's in the state. Right, it's in the country. It is. It's in the we country, have right. no diagnosis. I was just that was like leading into it. We, <laughs> we have no known. But for the folks at home, there yeah. are no diagnosis. We have no cases. known diagnosed cases. We don't have any suspicions on our radar. It's um, it, that's a good thing. And Amy, in her position, she'll get notified. She'll, she'll know. Um, and at that point. You know, we still can't pass out that information um, based and on... And even if we did, I'm making a big deal that we don't, but even if we did, we, d we do have systems in place to make sure that it is under control and that we keep you safe. So I want even, I, I make a big deal that it's not here, but if it were, and we did have diagnosed cases in East Long Meadow, Paul right. and I work really hard for you, even when there's not something that we need to come and present to you on, to make sure that we have plans and processes in place for situations like this. We have, all safe. we have an emergency preparedness team that talks about this stuff when it's not an issue. So when it is an issue, we know how to prepare and protect you. So with that said, why don't you ask us your questions? My concern is about 
about money. Mm -hmm. Everybody handles the money. Right. And it could go all over. Right. In, in a flash. Mm -hmm. So what do you do if just avoid using cash? Right. So just like with the flu uh, or norovirus, we're handling money that people are sick and touching every single day. Every time we use money, someone who is sick could have been handling that money. The key to preventing not only coronavirus, but all the other viruses and illnesses that we all try to protect ourselves from on a daily basis is proper hand washing, right? Avoiding touching our face or our eyes. You, you'd be surprised. I saw um, an, a press conference where the woman was literally saying, don't touch your face, as she licked her finger and slipped to the next page, right? I, I, on a, if you could be the healthiest place in the world, and that would still gross me out and give shivers down my spine, because I just know how dirty our hands are, even if we think we've done a great job washing them. So when it comes to the money, or anything for that matter, doorknobs, just when you, w the first thing you should do when you walk into your house is walk to your sink, turn on the water, and wash your hands. So in case you don't go on social media, I'm going to give you a quick tutor tutorial on proper hand washing, because it is really, really the most important thing you guys can do to protect yourself. You walk to your sink, you turn on the water. The first thing you do is slightly wet, wet your hands. Then you use an ample amount of soap. And you scrub without water, because this is where a lot of people make a mistake, for at least 20 seconds. Palms of your hands, nail beds of your hands, in between your, fingernail, in between your fingers, uh, nail beds, back of your hand, your wrist, and then pay attention to around any jewelry, because th that stuff will hold it there. And your thumbs, yeah, the guy in the back. Definitely get your thumbs, okay? Then you use as, hot, as much hot water as you can handle, dry it off, get your paper towel, dispo so you know how some people keep a dish rag next to their sink and they're drying their hands off on the dish rag? Right now and for the winters and flu season, I would avoid that. Because using that disposable paper towel is a really good way to get those last germs that you didn't get off, off. And then if your if you're trash can, you have to touch it, use the Shut off your water with the paper towel, and then use that paper towel to open your trash can and dispose of your paper towel. That way you know when you come in, even if you got exposed to something, when you come into your house, you are now clean. <coughs> your hands are clean. You're not going to put it on your counter and then put it on your TV remote and then put it on your bathroom shower. Your hand, you're coming in and you're cleaning your hands. So that's, that's important whether you're dealing with money or, or anything. How many people go to the grocery store or Costco the past couple of weekends, every cashier had a pair of gloves on. You see it all the time. Well, imagine this. I come in, I'm infected. Not sick, but I, you know, I'm a carrier. I hand my Costco card to that cashier. Innocently enough, she looks at it. She does what she needs to do with it. She runs it through the machine. I back up. She's still got the gloves on, same pair of gloves. You come in, you're not infected, you're feeling fine. You hand her your card. Now what was ever on her fingertips? is on that card. You take that card back 30 seconds later, you look at it, you put it in your wallet or your, your purse and you move on. The gloves, it's good, but I think the best protection is constantly wash your hands. Um, the disinfectant's good for the hands, but you still need to wash whatever's on your hands, off your hands. Yeah, so sanitizer, the, um, if you look at the back, it has to be 70% alcohol or higher to be effective. But even then, washing is still your best bet. So I keep sanitizer in my car. I use it as I'm going in and out of places in case I do happen to accidentally touch my face or touch my phone. But when you, when you are around a sink, sink is your best option. So great question. Look at that. That was a, a much longer answer than I think you probably anticipated. Other questions? Yes. I was told that if you sing one chorus of Old MacDonald Had a Farm, that's 20 seconds. Okay, I don't, I've heard or happy birthday Lord's twice. Prayer. Um, I don't know. If you want to time whatever, it, everyone sings works. in a different way. Whatever works. Yeah. 20 seconds is longer than some of us think it is or shorter than some of us think it is. Exactly, yeah. So if there's something that takes 20 seconds, Get a little, um, well, no, don't do that. That's a lot. No, they don't do 20 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> they get something and touch it, and then touch it again, and then think, no, you've already done yourself. Think about those medical shows you see where the surgeons are getting ready to operate, and, and, and literally they're probably there for like a minute, just scrubbing their hands and their elbows all the way up, and, and that's what they do. How about the news channel? Which one do you believe? Or who do you believe? The, the health department. <laughs> Turn you know, into El Cat and we'll find everything. I don't believe anybody in the White House. 
I'm going to answer your question. I'm, I'm going to answer your question. In public health, one of the key things that we are taught is consistent messaging. Because in this situation, we have one message coming from the CDC, one message coming from the president, one message coming from your Amy Petrosky, another message that might be coming from the chief. And it is really hard to know which one to believe. Some of them are, you know, the media, they're trying to get hype. They want the ratings, right? It's really hard to know who to believe. But there are some very fundamental basics, whether you want to believe that it's, it's not a big deal, right? Our president says this is not a big deal. It's just a minor cold. Or if you want to believe some of the scare tactics or other professionals that say this is a big deal. If you get this, you are going to get very sick. Myself, I err on the side of caution. If someone tells me, ah, don't worry about it. You can jump off that bridge. The water's plenty deep. Or there's another guy sitting there saying, you know what, I don't know, the tide looks pretty low today. I'm going to say, you know what, the tide looks pretty low today. Because I'm going to err on whatever side it is that best protects me. And it doesn't matter what political side of the aisle you fall on. I think we're all here because we care about our health. And that is really the priority. And, and to think about who's right or who's wrong, the, this could strike somebody just like the flu. Take somebody young, 30 years old, in, in perfect health. And they, they're going to get it. Yeah, it's going to seem like a really bad cold to them. But take somebody, you know, that is already Im immune compromised or has underlying respiratory and health issues. That could be a fatal, fatal illness for them. So it, it, to, to me, if I don't need to get it and I can do whatever I can do not to get it and make sure my family doesn't get it. My, my wife watches five granddaughters every day. I do not want to, I don't want to bring this home to them. And, in, and right now they're not talking, they're not, they're not worried about children getting it for some reason. They're, they're carriers, they, but they're not getting ill from it in most cases. I still don't want to bring it home. And, and that's the way we all should be. We don't want to bring it home to our partners and our, you know, our, our family members. And that that's, uh, segues into two important pieces of information for me. One, when Chief was talking about the younger person not necessarily having uh, as, as a drastic effect from it, one of the first travelers that came back from Italy uh, on that school trip I believe he was 40 years old. He's been in the hospital for over two and a half weeks. He was on a respirator. He got his last rites. He was a healthy 40-year-old man. But there's other people that get it, and it isn't as severe. So you just don't, you don't know what it's going to do to your body until it's in your body. The second piece is the population that it is affecting the most are 60-plus, those with weakened immune systems, immunocompromised systems, or already existing breathing problems like asthma, my mother gets a cold, it always turns into pneumonia, right? So those are the people that this is affecting the most. So that's one of the reasons coming here today for the chief and I was so important, because this is a population that if it does come to East Longmeadow and you are exposed, you are the population that are going to be affected. Which we're trying to prevent. Right. <laughs> Prevention. Did I miss that, that message? No, you didn't. No, oh, okay. you, you brought that in. Okay. I just wanted to emphasize. Hmm. We have a trip coming up in about a month. Would you advise it, like, or yeah. it's not an important trip? Yeah, what would you do? Trip. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, based on the governor's state of emergency yesterday, he is uh, instructing all um, his executive branch to not complete any non-essential traveling. If you are 60 or over, or if you have any underlying medical conditions, if we fall into that category, the recommendation is to not complete that trip. Where are you traveling to? Can Where I are get you traveling to? I have a I have a cruise in two and a half weeks. Probably not. Probably not. Um, we're we're just we're holding out. Um, my wife. No, uh, fortunately enough, the cruise line has. Um, offer to uh, you can cancel they'll give you a full credit towards a future cruise within a year and a half or something like that which will work for us so um, my wife and I we just haven't pulled the trigger on it yet but I mean I'm not the most of the cruise lines you hear about one on the west coast you hear about one in Japan and there hasn't been much other ones but I don't want to be that third one stuck on a cruise ship for 14 extra days so um, I'm getting a lot of coaching from my director of public health and, uh, <laughs> no, and, and, and the town manager. Um, I'm getting a lot of coaching. So, so we did. So we talked about that it mostly affects those over 60 or immunocompromised or those who frequently get lung problems with colds. 
the kids, for whatever reason, pediatric patients, we're not seeing this really affect them like we usually do. So if you think about H1N1, we closed the schools, we disinfected the schools, we did a lot of things in the schools to stop the spread. So in the upcoming months, you might hear a lot of information about non-pharmaceutical interventions. Because if it starts to take place in our community, that's, that's the best way for us to stop the spread. And that means, basically what that means is the quarantines. So if you have been exposed to it, you quarantine, you've heard about that. We, you, you know, you limit the access to certain places, right? The kids right now, we're not talking about anything like that in schools, other than what the governor suggested of parties of 50 or more uh, looking at canceling those events. Um, we don't know why, but what we do know, and this is why it's important for you guys, is they think, and they don't know, but they think they might be carriers. So if you have a grandchild or someone who is in school that you know there's been an exposure, like I think they just had a school down in West Springfield to do a deep clean. If that happens to be your grandchild's school, you might want to think about not seeing that grandkid for 14 days because they, they're doing their best to disinfect that school, but if there was an exposure, that kid may not get sick. But when they come and share your ice cream, you might end up getting sick. So thinking about that in terms of the children that you relate to in your life is something to also, also keep in mind. More questions? You keep talking about 14 days. What about after that? If we stay at home for 14 days, are we allowed out? How long does that virus sit or stay with us? If we're carrying it, how long? Okay. So that right now, they don't n know what the incubation period is. But, so that means like how long is it in your body before you start to get sick, right? They don't, they don't know what that is. Some, some people have said five days until you start to show symptoms after exposure. But because this is such a new virus, we don't have the answers to that. The 14-day quarantine is really what they're having you stay inside to make sure you don't get sick. If you've been exposed and you've stayed inside for 14 days, CDC is saying you don't have that virus, so it's safe to come back outside. I think that was your question. It was. Okay. It was. It's two weeks and they go back and say, quarantine for two weeks, you won't come out and get it. You might, yeah, that's yeah, true. You could. So it's, yeah. The quarantine is not for healthy people or for people who have no suspected exposure. So I think that that's where the confusion might be. The only reason you would stay inside for 14 days is if you were taking the bus, we have a local bus, if you were on the bus and DPA, there was a person who was on that bus, the driver had uh, coronavirus. DPH would then do a trace back. So DPH is the Department of Public Health. They're the state version of what I do. So they do a trace back and say, who rode the bus that day? So we know by their bus card. Person A rode the bus, person B rode the bus. So they call you, or they call me, and then we call you, <laughs> and we say, hey, you know, you were on a bus, the person some, was someone on that bus who had coronavirus. You have to be under a 14-day quarantine. We're gonna call you every day, twice a day, and we're gonna say, what's your temperature, person A? Great, and we write that down. Then we're gonna call you in the, in the afternoon, and we're gonna say, person A, what's your temperature right now? And we're gonna write that down. How do you feel? Do you feel sick? Any shortness of breath? Any congestion? No. And then we do it again on the next day. Okay, so that's how we make sure we don't release you from a quarantine until we know you're safe. That's how we protect everybody else in the community. Okay, does that make in, sense? In quarantine, correct me if I'm wrong, Amy, but from what I understand, quarantine, you can step out on your porch. Mm -hmm. You have your porch, you can step out. It's it, quarantine, you just need to be away from other people. So if you wanna, if you wanna walk out on your porch and 10 feet away from your porch and get some fresh air, especially a day like today when it's nice out, do that. And if you have a yard, that you can go out in and not you're not going to bump into anybody else. Bring your dog out, walk your dog. It's not you're not stuck in your apartment. You're not stuck in your home, um, so you can have get some fresh air, and, um, and not not be so isolated where you're you're locked in. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, saying that animals can't get this, mm -hmm. and we haven't heard anything about animals. So the most recent study that I read, and again, it's constantly evolving, so this could change. We could get something tomorrow that says something totally different. Animals can get it, but they can't pass it, right? So there was a case where a dog got it, but they, are, they can't pass it to us. Still, I wouldn't recommend getting all up in your dog's face. Yeah. 
CDC suggests that this is going to end up getting into our society just like the flu has and end up being something that we deal with more regularly. The problem is right now none of us have any immune, immune system built up to protect it. But again, that's not fact. That is just what they're predicting. That 2017 was like 80,000 people in the United States died of flu. Um, so, and the, this last year was 41,000 plus. So, but we, we don't hear about those deaths. Follow us, you do. <laughs> <laughs> but the news isn't always pounding it into your head. Right. Certain so, times of the year they are. Yeah. Here's what I'll say about that. The, I believe at the end of this, the death rate from coronavirus is going to be higher than the death rate from the flu. And I, I, that's my personal opinion, and I, I can't really give you scientific information. It's just the, the I take information from a lot of sources, and I, I form an opinion. And I, I think the sources that say, you know, not, the flu is, is much worse this year is, is not using all the data that we have available to us to come up to that conclusion. Partly is because we don't have longitudinal data to look at for coronavirus, right? We're looking at a very small portion of information. I think as we start to see the numbers come out of Italy and Iran and the other places that are starting to see an uptick in this, we're going to have a much better idea of, the, of the, the death rate that's associated with this. Because the death rate for the flu, 0.1%? Right? So, I, and I think there's a difference here of... There are, are there, I'm, I'm sure your numbers were right, whatever they were, but it, the specific is not as important. But there's tons more people who get the flu, so the death rate is small. We're not looking at the big, we're the whole number. We're looking at the percentage of people, how many, out of how many people who get it, how many people those are, end up dying. So the death rate is the, is the number that is more concerning to me than the actual number of people who die from it. Does that make sense? Helpful? Maybe not. That's okay. You don't have to tell me to my face. <laughs> you can talk about it after I leave. <laughs> so, so that's a great question. So what happened at the beginning was the CDC sent the states a bunch of tests. And then they said, oh, wait a minute. Those tests aren't working. Send them back. And the CDC said, we're going to get you more test kits. And it was, I think, three and a half weeks before more test kits were delivered. So starting two weeks ago on Friday, so in a couple days it will be two weeks ago, the state had tests that were sent from the CDC that were um, useful. So that is why we are starting to see the numbers rise in Massachusetts. We are not yet sure if the numbers are rising because there's more people here that are getting sick or if there's just more people who are getting tested, right? So that's why yesterday, what we saw yesterday, and a, a lot of people might have missed this in the governor's re uh, response, the reason why he declared the state of emergency yesterday and why you saw all those people up on the stage, if you saw it, was because we had our first community-acquired transmission. So what that means is the person who got it wasn't directly infected by someone they knew. Right? Seventy of the cases in Massachusetts are from that Biogen conference. We can trace that back and we can say, you were at the Biogen conference. There were people there with coronavirus. We could trace that back or we can say, Paul, you came back from that cruise and there were people on that cruise ship that had coronavirus. We know why you got coronavirus. But what happened yesterday that was different is that we had someone who contracted coronavirus that we have no known cause or association to base it off of. And that's why things changed yesterday. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Stay with me. Well, one, of the, one of the scary things is, is the, the people that are getting sick, not everybody's calling. I mean, how many times have you been home with the flu and not even called your, 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 your own doctor, right? I, I, I just got a bad case of the flu and I'm just going to suck it up. And, and, and there's got to be some fear in people saying, hey, if I call my doctor and, and he finds out I just got back from a trip to Italy, he's going to tell me I got to stay in my house for 14 days. I can't do that. So he's just staying off the radar. And, and that's, that's one of my biggest fears is we're missing, we're missing that piece of the population that's out there. And they're out there. Um, and not just in Massachusetts, it's probably all across the country. I mean, if you look at the map, global, uh, the United States map of where the, the cases are, there's still some states that haven't been hit yet. That's, uh, how, how, how possible is that? So, 
these people don't travel outside of their state. Nobody's been in the state to visit. So I, I think I think you're going to, I mean, in reality, same thing with the flu. I mean, they, 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 that total number of flu cases is probably a projection based on the ones that report and the ones that don't report, and they figure that number out somewhere. So that's why one of, one second, Marilyn, that's why one of our messages as a public health professional is personal protection, right? If if you're sick, don't go out. If you're out, wash your hands. If, you know, don't touch, don't stand this close to people. Do the elbow bump instead of the handshake. Protect yourself. One of the things that the Italian Prime Minister, I think he's the Prime Minister of Health, said is uh, our habits have to change, right? Our habits have to change in order for us to control this virus in our community. And the same sentiment I would echo here. Our habits have to change. If we're not used to walking into our house and washing our hands right away, our habits have to change. And that is how we're going to make a difference in our community. Okay. Um, as a board member here, um, my concern is how do we respond if we have an identified case in Building A? Mm -hmm. do, what do we do? I mean, do um, you quarantine within the apartment? Mm -hmm. Do you quarantine within the floor? Mm -hmm. Do you, I mean, I'm, I'm just curious, and, and if there is a quarantine, how lengthy are we to anticipate that we have to, you know, keep our re residents away from <coughs> one another? Right. I, I mean, that's, that's the, the board's concern. Be, if there is a quarantine, HIPAA, there's no way you guys will officially know unless the person self-reports. Well, I'm hoping that we're going to have very uh, um, proactive very residents. Very that proactive are dialogue. And sick right. So that we can be sure that you're safe and that you're getting nourishment and that you're following the procedures that we put in place as a board, as a board of health, to protect everyone. And so um, I guess it's. It's it's a hard it's a hard path to follow um, because I can see it just escalating very quickly. If we don't so one one thing there, uh, Marilyn, to differentiate is a quarantine versus a presumptive positive versus a, a confirmed positive. Okay. So a quarantine could be we were all um, in the same room together and we may never get sick, right? It's a quarantine out of protective measures to see what happens. That's when you hear from me or my nurse twice a day to see your temperature. So a quarantine might never evolve to anything, so putting in any measures or like getting everybody all upset may not need to happen. Now, if they get sick and then they're, they, they get tested and they're a presumptive positive, that means the state lab has swabbed you, they've, they've confirmed that you have a coronavirus, but the CDC now needs to make the final decision whether you're carrying coronavirus. So you know, if we were to get to a place where we had a diagnosis, I imagine people in the community are going to be really open about that because they're, they're going to be ill, right? Or they're going to need supports. Right. Um, but a, a quarantine, I think, is a, is a little a little couple steps ahead of that. Okay. okay. Any other questions? <clears throat> Just a curiosity. Why was the cruise ship hit so hard? Is it a, a where they where they were where they came from and a confined space thing? And, and I think there's a combination of every one of those. <laughs> Is that, have you ever been on a cruise ship? Yeah. It's a floating petri dish. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sir, uh, and, and, and we we've seen it in the past. It's it's it makes national news at least once a year where a cruise ship is is held in port or not allowed to come into port because of the neurovirus. Um, I've been on several of them and it's you see people and, and the staff is wiping railings they're, they're 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 hand sanitizers before you walk into the um any of the dining rooms they're they're hitting you up make sure you get you wash your hands before you come to dinner or you know after your the pool so on a side I, I note hand sanitizer cannot kill neurovirus <laughs> segue so um i i think i think that's part of it and in in and the, the, their fear with the original one was, I think there was one person sick initially, and then they quarantined it. And quite frankly, I think that hurt them, being stuck on that ship for 14 extra days before they were allowed to get off the ship and then go into another quarantine. So now, just picture being stuck in your, in your most of those cabins are small. They're not all on the outside with a balcony. You can stand out on a balcony, get fresh air. I, I would get sick just sitting there. 
Um, so, and then who's bringing your food? Who's doing your laundry? Who's doing all that? So that just helps. If, if there is the germ, the germ's not going away anytime soon. So uh, I'm not saying that was a right or wrong choice on their part. I, I, I would have much preferred if that were me to be off the ship and then deal with it myself. But I don't know. I don't know what the right answer is. The ships are, you know, floating Petri dishes that, you know, you got some of the ships hold upwards to 7,500 people between um, guests and staff. So, you know, it's half the size of East Long Meadow on a four or five football fields. Well, the reason it's a curiosity to me personally is because I was in the Coast Guard for four years. I was on a ship for three. We were out for months and never was a concern. How old were you at the time? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. I was one of the younger people. Just saying you were, you were, you were probably in the prime of your life Healthy as can be, you you, you could have got you could have got the bout of norovirus, and you, th you might have thought it was C you know seasickness. Who knows? I mean, but. In what sense? Why did it, why did it, it grow so rapidly? Yeah, I, yeah. I think they're trying to figure that out. They don't have the answer. Yeah, they're going down now. That's because those um, non-pharmaceutical interventions that yep. I talked, and MPIs, that's one of the things that they're doing. They're, they separated everybody. And one, one of the things that my public health geek in me is looking forward to is what are those numbers going to do? And I mean, they are coming down. Are we going to see another spike of people who have been sitting latent for five days and now they're going to start spiking again too? I really want to see because if this works, it is a really good uh, mechanism for other communities and states to look at. I right. think you That's look at, too. yeah, but look at um, New York, yeah. in New York, uh, was it New Rochelle? Yeah. yeah. And they got the, they, I mean, they're, they're on lockdown, so <laughs> yeah. they're on lockdown, and that's just a mini version of what they're doing in Italy. Uh, in the beginning uh, of your presentation, you mentioned that there are a couple of lists that we should be signed up for. Correct. Could you repeat them, please? Sure. I, are you on Facebook? Are you on Facebook? No. Okay. Uh, so then it is Rave. Do you know how to get to Rave? It's a, there's a link on the website. We can get it to. Um, we're going to get it to them because it would take me a couple minutes to find the. Oh, so I check with Emma? Yes. Oh, okay. Check with Emma. I will have it to her by the end of the day. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And that basically what that will do is allows you to sign up. Um, so last night I sent out a robocall, if, if some of you are on it, it's a call, a text, or an email. And basically they all are, say the same thing, but some are allowed to be longer than normal. I did it for Triple E, West Nile, tick season, something like this we would do it for. Anything that really affects the entire town. It's a great call. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it was a good call. Thank you. We got, I got some good feedback on that, that it was informative, not scary, clear, concise. So these calls were they're from anybody in town who needs, um, municipally, who needs to get information out to you. So uh, the day before your taxes are due, the collector might send a message to say, just a reminder, quarter four taxes are due tomorrow. We're open until 8 p.m. to accommodate anybody. Yeah. Uh, it usually says, if you've got the caller ID, it's T of East Long Meadow. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Or um, for election day, they call and they say, tomorrow election day, it's at Birchland Park Middle School. Yep. Yeah. Uh, from 8 to 8. You know, so it's those kind of updates. Mm -hmm. For me, it tends to be more of the medical and um, public health end of things, okay. or emergency, any kind of emergency Great. information. So who should have gotten the call last night? Anybody who has signed up for the town notification system. You were signed up and you didn't get it. No. Oh. That's what we're going to get for you. We're going to. So you'll go to a link. You'll put in how you want to be notified. I want to be notified by text message. Uh, phone or email. You can check all three. That way, no matter what you're doing, you'll be able to be notified. And then when any of the departments send out that notification, like DPW uses it. Porter Road will be shut down tomorrow between number 6 and 30 for a water main break. So there are a variety of reasons that it's used, and it's really um, a useful tool. And, and it's, it's not overused. All the information that comes out is, is 
Um, yeah, it's not as bad as telemarketers calling you. Yes. <laughs> and you can just hang up. No, no feelings are hurt. I, I would like to thank Amy and Paul for the presentation. Uh, yes. As I can only uh, underline and uh, score, this is a fluid situation. It changes by the hour. Their lives are very difficult now, trying just to keep up with the current information. And I think it's very simple to say that we sh should be preparing for the worst and hoping for the best. Right. That's the way we should live this thing through. There's no guarantees anywhere, but I want to thank these people for being in the front row of the fight against this. This, cause this is serious, uh, it, and we do not know where it's going. So we've got to prepare for the worst.